Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash for This Week in Prophecy, Tuesday, May 7th, 2019. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends, and thank you for joining us. As always, so much of the prophetically significant news events this week have taken place and are taking place in the Middle East. But let's begin in Europe and Turkey. What we're not being told by the mainstream media, in fact, although it's reported, nobody's analyzing it and telling the actual factual truth concerning the ramifications of what's happening. For some time, we've been warning about the Islamist policies of Erdogan in Turkey, Tayyip Erdogan. He's departed from the foundation principles of the Turkish state going back to the time of Atatuka where religion and government would be separate. It was sort of like MacArthur's constitutional plan for post-war Japan, where Shintoism and emperor worship would be something that would be cultural, religious, but have no political ramification for the nation any longer. It would be something separate. Japan would be a secular democracy. Its religion was a cultural and religious matter only, so too, was the belief of Atatürk. Erdogan has tried to reverse that, going back to the Ottoman Empire, putting Turkey in the position of a leadership role in the Islamic world and having a de facto hegemony over the Arab world as it's always had. This has been his ambition from the get-go and to do that he had to transform Turkey into a more of a religious state, taking it away from its roots that it has had since the aftermath of the First World War. But let us continue looking at this. He had suffered major defeats this week in prophecy as the final votes were counted in local and by elections, in municipal elections nationally, his parties have his party has suffered major defeat. The Islamists were delivered a rebuke by the Turkish voters on a wide scale. As a result, he is calling new elections, simply invalidating the elections that took place. To this, the European Union has responded, calling this an attack on Turkish democracy, it being incompatible with democratic process, and being problematic that Turkey, being a NATO country, would essentially disenfranchise the voters and countermand their expressed democratic will by having an alternative election in order to get a result that the political establishment and religious establishment of Erdogan want to have. Erdogan has taken Turkey from being a friend of Israel to virtually hostile to Israel, and it has alienated itself within NATO even destroying its eligibility for American advanced F-35 fighters because it is purchasing Russian manufactured S-400s and S-500s that the United States will not allow the F-35s to be tested against. So the Russians would not be able to counteract the American technology having prototypes in a battlefield scenario. Some of the Emirates, of course, have bought the same technology, and we can be sure that the American Air Force and Navy will be testing the F-35s and F-22s against the S-400s and S-500s, and Israel will undoubtedly be involved in this unpublished series of events that are going to take place and have already begun to take place. But of course, that is not discussed by governments, by the military establishment or the intelligence community and you're not going to find comment on it in the mainstream press. But you can be sure that any of the Emirates, any of the Sunni countries buying Russian anti-aircraft technology, the United States has already arranged with the participation of Israel and the Saudi government of Mohammed uh, bin Salman to test advanced American fighter aircrafts, particularly the stealth aircraft of the F-22 and the F-35 against the S-400s and possibly S-500s. This is what's taking place.
But let's return to what's taking place in Turkey and in Brussels. The European establishment has publicly, publicly spoken out in utter rebuke of the actions of the Erdogan regime. You don't like the result of the election, so you're going to have another election. Notice the hypocrisy, the dual standards of the Brussels establishment. This is something we are seeing internationally. We've certainly seen it in the United States, where Hillary Clinton was defeated the Democratic Party, which has moved increasingly to the left and the mainstream media, the left-wing academic establishment, don't like the results of the election. So they tried to find alternative means to nullify the election by weaponizing the judiciary. More of that in a moment. In Europe, however, what Turkey is doing is something that Europe pushes in Europe. There have been no fewer than four referendums concerning the place of Ireland in the European Union. And when the Irish voters did not vote the pro-European way that the Irish establishment and the Brussels establishment wanted, they would simply hold another referendum until they got the result they wanted. This was done repeatedly in Ireland. And now the Brussels establishment, together with the Europhiles of Great Britain, are pushing for another Brexit vote in Great Britain, trying to nullify the already expressed democratic will of the popular majority of the British voters, where you have a situation of parliament versus the people. Theresa May, the Corbyn opposition, it doesn't matter. The establishment of Great Britain, of both parties, are trying to undermine British democracy and sovereignty and reverse the democratic will as expressed by the British voter. The reason, of course, they are doing this is because they have their agenda. What the people voted doesn't matter to them. They will repackage it. They'll pretend that they're somehow going to keep Brexit but it will be a Brexit in name only, and it will be even worse because Britain will no longer have a voice within Brussels. The hypocrisy and corruption is unbelievable. The EU itself and the pro-European political establishment in Great Britain and in Ireland are doing the same exact thing Erdogan does. There is no difference between Erdogan and the British establishment or the Irish establishment of Fine Gael and Fine Foyle, the political parties of Ireland. There's no difference, absolutely no difference whatsoever. They're castigating Turkey for doing what they've been doing themselves. Now, I agree what Erdogan is doing, trying to countermand the electoral will of the Turkish people is an outrage and a disgrace and an attack on democracy. But so is what has happened in the United States with Comey, with the deep state conspiracy, criminal. And so is what has happened in the European Union. Yes, it is absolutely true. Erdogan is a despot, he's a dangerous man, he is no proponent of democratic values. Either is Brussels, and either is the Democratic Party of the United States, or the Republican Party establishment, or the political establishment of either the Conservative or the Labour Party in Great Britain. These are the realities. Erdogan is what they are. They are what he is. What's the difference? Six of one, half dozen of the other. But that is what is taking place this week in prophecy. Now, we understand the importance of Turkey and end time prophecy. This strongly comes into play. We understand the importance 
of a reconfederated Roman Empire, an end time prophecy. This also comes in to play. And it's playing out this week. This week in prophecy, more posturing. 19 Gazans killed, four Israelis killed after 700 rockets are fired from Gaza into Israel, the area of Ashkelon and Ashdod, south of Tel Aviv, along the coast and in the adjoining border regions of Kiryat Gat and Sterot. This includes <coughs> the Bardar III, which is a fragmentation bomb firing 1,400 bolts upon explosion. It's a very dangerous anti-personnel weapon being used against Israeli civilians. It is God's grace that more Israelis have not been killed. But it is the usual game. The radical Islamic extremists who control Hamas and Islamic Jihad fire upon Israeli civilians and then use their own civilians as human shields so when the Israelis are forced to fire back in self-defense, the BBC, the CNN, the Washington Post, the international media will blame Israel. Same usual game. But let's press forward and understand the entire scope of what's taking place. Many Israelis are not happy with the ceasefire brokered with Hamas and Islamic Jihad by the Netanyahu government. They wanted a stronger response, and it did not happen. In fact, there's a scheduled protest of thousands of protesters coming from the areas of Israel near Gaza to Jerusalem to protest at the Knesset against the policy of the Netanyahu government in light of this latest ceasefire. Odd as it may be, a major, major cultural event, probably the largest cultural event in Europe, with the possible exception of football, the soccer championships or something, but the largest annual event is always the Eurovision Song Contest. Uh, it's difficult to explain to North Americans and others what a major event this is in, in Europe and in Israel. Well, the event was to be hosted and is to be hosted this year in Israel. Hence, because of the timing of the event, it was the ambition of Hamas and Islamic Jihad to destroy it and try to force its cancellation. Hence, they attacked when they did. That was part of their motive. It would sort of be like when the Carter administration upset the Moscow Olympics following the invasion of Afghanistan. It would be that kind of a thing. We're going to force the contest not to be held in Israel this year, even though it's Israel's turn. Well, <clears throat> this has handcuffed the capacity of Mr. Netanyahu to respond as aggressively as he wanted to. If there was a major response with even a military incursion of armored divisions into Gaza to crush Hamas once and for all or anything like it, it would have ramifications politically and it would have obviously caused a problem for the going forward of the Eurovision Song Contest. What we have here is posturing. Do not be surprised if afterwards there's a resumption of hostilities. But for the time being, they've stopped. The Israelis responded with major, major airstrikes and have changed their strategy. They have gone back to killing Hamas commanders having killed a major Hamas field commander, they're targeting the leadership once again, a strategy that they had considerable success with a decade ago. Secondly, they've been hitting buildings, tall buildings, uh, in the center of, of commercial areas that have been used or are being used by the Hamas regime. Again, Hamas uses civilian shields against Israeli counterattacks. 
this time, Israel has gone after the command and control centers, no matter where they are, including in tall buildings in the middle of Gaza City. This has brought about a pressure on Hamas and Islamic Jihad to agree to a ceasefire. The Israeli counterattacks and airstrikes were relentless, and they also involved tanks. When Israel uses tanks instead of artillery, 155 millimeter artillery, instead it is using tanks, tanks are mobile and it sends the signal that we're ready to cross the border into Gaza. This has obviously caused considerable trouble for Hamas. So what we see here now is a matter of posturing. It did not escalate to the full conflict it could have, as it did in 2006, but it may still do so. The Israelis were handicapped in how aggressive their response can be because of the Eurovision Song Contest, and Hamas is handicapped because of its inability to strike back at Israel effectively, despite having the Bandit three rockets now, provided, of course, by Iran. Meanwhile, American Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who'd been scheduled to meet in Berlin with Angela Merkel, canceled his meeting with her and is headed to the Middle East for an undisclosed mission and meetings. This happens at the same time as another American aircraft carrier group has approached the Straits of Hormuz, the entrance to the Persian Gulf, very close to Iran. Iran has made it clear that it will close the Straits of Hormuz, at least that's what they are threatening, if their economy continues to be affected by the American embargo. The Americans, as we reported last week in Prophecy, have expanded it, no longer giving waivers to certain countries to find alternative sources to Iranian oil. The pressure is growing. 40% inflation at least. Prices growing faster than people can afford to pay for essential items. The Trump administration is obviously trying to bring about social and political instability by economic means. The regime in Iran are extremely troubled and are using the one response they have, rattling their sword. The Trump administration has called their bluff and made a major deployment of American naval aircraft, not only in the eastern Mediterranean, capable of hitting Iranian targets in Syria, but also hitting Iran directly should they intervene or interfere with the transport of oil through the Straits of Hormuz, where 8% of the world's oil trade goes through. Quite a situation. Mr. Trump is playing a hardball. We urge you to keep him in prayer. This week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the Palestinians have announced that they believe by swarming, by shooting large amounts of missiles and rockets, they can outmaneuver the Israeli Iron Dome defense system. Simply by firing larger amounts of rockets and projectiles in a concentrated area. This strategy is the same strategy the United States and Israel have developed to neutralize the effects of the Russian manufactured S-400 rocket system, except that America and Israel are also using stealth technology and satellite intelligence to do so, resources not available to obviously Hamas or their Iranian sponsors. Nonetheless, they believe by this swarming they can do damage and they can somehow neutralize the Iron Dome. They can make the Iron Dome less effective, that is for sure. But the government of Israel says that they certainly are not in a position to neutralize it. This is what is happening this week in prophecy. But there is a further development going on this week. Let us look at the era of McCarthyism. 
Going back to the 1950s, Senator Joe McCarthy, an Irish Catholic alcoholic, uh, was a vehement anti-communist, but went on his famous witch hunt, trying to purge Hollywood and others with accusations of collaboration with Russia, with being communists, and somehow colluding with Russia against the interests of the United States. These witch hunts persisted. Innocent people were brought before Congress. They were subpoenaed. Innocent people were harassed, forced to hire lawyers, paying exorbitant legal fees, had their careers destroyed in some cases. J. Edgar Hoover was a partner. So was the corrupt lawyer Roy Cohen as counsel to McCarthy's commission. Roy Cohen was, of course, the famous homosexual lawyer from New York, uh, a secular Jew who was not known for moral respectability in his personal life or for ethics, but he was the counsel at that time. Again, a cutthroat who simply used <clears throat> the national legislature and Congress as a platform to advance his own career interests. He died supposedly $7 million in debt to the IRS. Be this as it may, as unscrupulous as people like McCarthy and Cohen were, they were opposed by Joe Walsh from Georgetown University and others, and it finally, finally stopped. But this was McCarthyism. During this era, the Jewish American playwright Arthur Miller wrote The Crucible, addressing the Salem witch trials, but using the Salem witch trials as a metaphor for what was happening in the McCarthy era. This became a theatrical masterpiece celebrated by the left as a political editorial in the form of a play against McCarthyism. The left has ra railed against McCarthyism ever since. During the Clinton scandals with Monica Lewinsky, it was Congressman Jerry Nadler from New York, my native New York, who on the floor of the House of Representatives denounced investigations into Clinton's deeds within the Oval Office that saw Clinton disbarred for perjury and effectively emitting perverted and unnatural acts with the young woman the age of his daughter in the Oval Office. But he was disbarred for perjury. In defense of Clinton, however, it was Jerry Nadler, a guilty president, defending him, who called it McCarthyism. He said the Ken Starr investigations, special prosecutor investigations in the Congress were a sexual McCarthyism. Now this same Nadler is engaged in McCarthyism himself. Having lost the election, they accuse Mr. Trump of collusion with Russia. He's a McCarthyist. The same man who campaigned against what he wrongly identified as McCarthyism when it was Clinton who was actually guilty. No evidence that Mr. Trump was guilty, despite all 19 of Mueller's prosecutorial staff being Clinton Democrats. He's now saying he wants investigations for the obstruction of justice for a crime that never happened. Again, the hypocrisy that knows no and this is McCarthyism. Nadler is no different than Joe McCarthy or Roy Cohen. He's doing the same thing. I wish we had an Arthur Miller to write a, po a play about him. But that's what is happening this week 
in prophecy. Finally, this week in prophecy, an issue that we have been trying to address for some time, but other events prevented us from getting around to it. We have an editorial, of course, by Ruben Rothler, who writes on behalf of Moriel, concerning Leviathan. The Leviathan oil and natural gas field is massive. It raises the specter of competition between Israel and Russia as a provider of natural gas to the European markets. It is a strategic factor in Mr. Putin's efforts to preserve the regimes in Syria and to collaborate with the Iranians who are backing the Assad regime in Syria in order to also maintain a foothold control of Lebanon, making appeals that the oil and natural gas fields are not exclusively Israeli. Now, the Israelis say it is nothing to do territorially or geographically or geologically with Lebanon. More than that, the Americans have given the Israelis a technology for horizontal drilling that is not available in Russia. But it has become a political bruja, and it is becoming more of one even as we speak. Russia is desperately reliant on foreign exchange. Its exportation of energy to the European markets is vital to its troubled economy, to keep the ruble itself even buoyant and not falling to lower levels of value against the dollar and against the euro. Let's read the analysis by Ruben Rothler. Leviathan, will an energy production competition between Israel and Russia, with Israel as an economic rival to Russia's European markets, help foster a future conflict? Could it become a driving factor in any Gog or Magog scenario? Leviathan, the geopolitical, economic, and strategic realities, again, provided to us courtesy of Ruben Rothler writing for Moriel. Since its establishment, Israel's Achilles heel has been its reliance upon imports to meet its energy requirements. The situation radically changed in 2009 with the discovery of the Tamar offshore gas field within Israel's maritime exclusive economic zone. This windfall was fortified by the discovery of the even larger gas and oil reserve, Leviathan, the following year in 2010. Not only have these reserves placed Israel in a position to become energy independent, but they've also transformed it into a net exporter of gas. So far, its principal client has been Jordan. Withstanding the objections of a majority of its parliament, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan purchased $10 billion worth of gas last year. Indeed, this newfound abundance of natural resource has profound political, strategic, and economic implications for Israel's relationship with its neighbors. Leviathan is featured as a maritime border dispute between Israel and Lebanon. In particular, Hezbollah has trumpeted Lebanese sovereignty, claiming partial control of these reserves. Israel has not been hesitant in repudiating such assertions. Several cabinet ministers have affirmatively stated that Israel will take swift and immediate military action to counter any use of force against the infrastructure being installed. As a practical measure, the Israeli Navy has purchased a number of additional corvettes to bolster its presence in the disputed waters. At present, it seems that Lebanon has neither the will nor ability to take matters further. The only plausible scenario for an eruption of conflict would be a situation in which Hezbollah acquires advanced anti-ship missiles from Iran, as it has in the past, and launches them against Israeli naval targets in the rigs. 
A notable geopolitical outcome of the gas fields has been the blossoming relationship between Israel, Greek Cyprus, and Greece, which until recently has been lukewarm at best. The precursor of this was the deterioration in ties between Israel and Turkey. Israel's traditional military cooperation with Turkey precluded a closer alliance with Greece, as Greece and Turkey were historically mutually alienated, even though they are both ostensibly NATO allies. However, Erdogan's rise to power altered this drastically. His Islamist party has acted with hostility towards Israel. He has adopted inflammatory rhetoric against Israel, reflecting some of the excesses of the Ayatollahs from Iran in this regard. He views himself as the leader of the Islamic world, resurrecting notions that hail back to the days of the Ottoman sultans. This has involved advocating for the Palestinian Arabs, particularly those in Gaza. Relations struck rock bottom following the Mabi Mamra incident when Israeli commandos boarded some of the vessels headed to break the blockade on Gaza that resulted in the deaths of eight Turkish citizens in the summer of 2010. Consequently, joint military drills were called off and the Israeli Air Force is no longer welcome to utilize Turkish airspace for training. The Greek government, however, has enthusiastically come to Israel's assistance in filling this logistical gap. Indeed, both military and economic ties have strengthened with expanded trade, particularly in the areas of technological goods and services. In concert with these moves, Israel and Greece and Greek Cyprus have signed agreements to endeavor in joint future exploration of bordering regions of their respective gas fields. Furthermore, ministers from Israel, Greece, Italy, and Cyprus, as well as the European Union's Commissioner for Climate Action and Energy, signed a joint declaration in 2017 to commit to building a gas pipeline that would bring natural gas from Israel and Cyprus to Italy and the European market via Greece. The pipeline, which Israeli Minister of Energy Yuval Steinitz described as the longest and deepest subsea gas pipeline in the world. <clears throat> I'm sorry, the longest and deepest subsea gas pipeline in the world is projected to be in operation by 2025. Steinitz surmised the project as the beginning of a wonderful friendship between four Mediterranean countries. While Miguel Irias Caniti, the UN Commissioner for Climate Action and Energy commented, we strongly support the development of the region, both from a general point of view and in particular as future gas suppliers. Although Kaniti could not make formal commitments, he expected the project to meet all the necessary requirements to receive funding via the EU's Connecting Europe facility, a program that supports the development of trans-European infrastructure and which already funded the project's commercial and technical viability study. Defined as a project of common interest by the European Union, the pipeline has been marketed as an alternative to the bloc's current reliance on Russian energy and on the depleting North Sea reserves. But some analysts have expressed reservations that the high infrastructure costs, coupled with low gas prices due to American fracking, will be able to compete with Russia and with Russian gas production, and that the project will be able to attract large amounts of investment capital. Brenda Schaefer, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center, suggested that the agreement represents the four countries' common political goals, which will not necessarily translate into investment decisions by commercial companies. Their considerations and goals may be different than the political level, Schaefer told one of the publications. At this stage, the proposed project is a political aspiration and far from a commercial reality. And it's not certain that current gas demand trends in Southern Europe commercially justify an additional new gas supply project. However, it is important to note that Texas-based Noble Energy, 
which owns almost 40% of Leviathan. Although it's Israeli, Greek, Cypriot, and Greek, it's 40% American-owned. Has access to advanced American technology, such as sophisticated innovations in horizontal drilling, which Russia's state-owned Gazprom lacks. This gives Israel a competitive edge in terms of extraction. Also, as of yet, we are unsure of how large Leviathan actually is. So for now, the jury is out on whether Israel will be able to compete with Russia as an alternative source of gas for the European Union. What is certain is that this new Greco-Israeli nexus has proved to be the conduit for improved European-Israeli relations. This is cemented by the fact that unlike other Middle Eastern gas-producing countries like Qatar, Israel has direct access to European seaports. The potential outcome and ramifications of this for Russia, for the EU, and for Israel are obvious. It would hurt Russia. It would certainly help Israel. And it would certainly be to the advantage of Europe if such a pipeline was built without needing to bring the pipeline through Eastern Europe into Western Europe all the way from Russia via the Ukraine. Russia has used their pipelines as political weapons in the past, and now a viable alternative is being proposed that would threaten Russia's near monopoly. At the same time, the United States, using super, super tankers, is transporting liquid gas from the United States, natural gas that has been frozen, and is now being unloaded in such ports as Danzig in Northern Europe on the Baltic. It's early days yet, and the lion's share is still very much with Mr. Putin and Russia. But the signs are there. Russia is no longer guaranteed the kind of leverage it had in controlling energy in the form of natural gas for the European markets. And it's Israel that is its problem. This is taking place this week in Prophecy. Thank you so much for listening. We hope to see our South African friends in South Africa very soon by the end of this month. We'll be there and we will be in Holland, Lord willing, this weekend. Please join us if you're in those countries. The details will be on moriel.org. God bless and thank you. My name is James Jacob Prash. Please pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for President Trump and pray for Brexit. Thank you. You can join Jacob Prash and Moriel Ministries at the end of this month, May 2019, in South Africa, in Pretoria, May 18th and 19th, in Port Elizabeth, May 21st and 22nd, and in Cape Town, May 25th and 26th.